Now, the person I go to whenever there is anything like a rats in the rank story <laughs> is Dr. John Bruni from Sage International. John, how are you? Not too bad, Jeremy. How are you? Yes, I am fine. Uh, did you see that this morning uh, Sam Dastiari has come out, ex New South Wales Senator for Labor, uh, yeah. to deny that he, in fact, is the one that uh, ASIO is talking about? Yeah. I guess there'll be a lot of people coming out and saying, I'm not the one, but it could be him. Well, look, you know, the good thing for whoever whoever was responsible is that the laws that were uh, put together in 2017 and, and came into action in 2018 on espionage and, 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 and uh, foreign interference, uh, they are not retrospective. So it's going to be in everyone's interest that may have fallen into that, well, who is it? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be in their interest to come out and publicly deny it was them, and there won't be too much that we, the public, can expect unless, of course, under parla uh, parliamentary privilege, the name does get leaked out at some point, and I suspect that it probably will. Yeah. Now, uh, my understanding is up until I think it was uh, who, who was Prime Minister back in 17, uh, 2017. Uh, it'll come to me. We, we had a few of them. Uh, uh, <laughs> they were turning over rather quickly, weren't they? Well, well, wasn't it Turnbull at the it time? It was Turnbull. Yes, it yeah, was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Now, before that time, it's it's very murky listening to these people talk about this particular subject, that yep. everyone knew what espionage was, everyone heard the word traitor and treason, uh, but we did not have any law. It was not against the law to be a spy or a traitor. Now, and then up came uh, Turnbull with this, um, you know, foreign influencing law. Mm. Uh, but before that... We didn't seem to take it seriously at all. Yet in every other country I can think of, they'd stand you up against the wall and shoot you, particularly in times of conflict. Uh, yes, Jeremy, and that's probably the reason why we didn't take uh, very good care of our uh, internal security. Look, we've had, um, we've had uh, um, um, espionage and spying laws uh, written into the Constitution since 1914, since the beginning of World War One, for the obvious reasons. Because, they, you know, we did have, and we identified, um, large elements of non-English speaking people in Australia who may harbour sympathies for "Quote unquote," the enemy, yep. and many of uh, many of them we locked up in um, detention camps. I won't say concentration camps, but you know <laughs> they yeah. were camps nonetheless. So uh, th there was an active uh, uh, law in place to take care of this sort of thing. But you have to understand the nature of the term treason no longer holds currency in a postmodern society like Australia. It, it does in the United States, perhaps, because they still hold on to the old notions of what it is to betray a country, yeah. and they do have the death penalty in certain states. And so they, they do maintain a sense of themselves uh, in, a con <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in a sort of policy continuity from the early days to now. Now, that has changed, um, but in a free market, freewheeling you know, money talks and everything else walks uh, mentality that we're living in at the moment. If someone were to come up to you and say, here, have a bag of money and just tell me what you think about blah, blah, blah. And, you know, times are tough and your employment positions might not be guaranteed or you, you were once someone well fettered by local authorities, but you are no longer that person. The temptation of taking the brown paper bag of money and saying, well, you know, I mean, there's no treason. Mm. I mean, it's just a, it's just a simple financial transaction. Yeah. Um, you know, and what's, and what's the punishment going to be? No one's going to put me up against the wall because we just don't do that kind of thing anymore. You know, even if old laws maintain themselves in a constitutional format, we just wouldn't do it. Could you imagine uh, the um, um, civil rights communities locally jumping up and down saying, you can't do this, you can't do that? I mean, currently, there, there, there are massive debates in Great Britain uh, about this ISIS bride, you know, who, who should quite 
likely have her citizenship taken away from her. But, you know, those people left of centre will say, well, that's a denial of her human rights. But, <laughs> you know, having said that, it isn't the denial of her human rights that she made a choice to join ISIS. You know, no, so, I mean, no. there, there are these kind of murky areas about where we see ourselves today as a modern left-leaning sort of state apparatus, yeah? Yeah, well, I, I don't. I think there should be something called consequences if you if you sign up to be an ISIS bride. You, mm. you, I'm assuming you're old enough and wise enough uh, to know better. But you know, you take consequences. Take the consequences of your behaviour. Well, we infantilize so many people these days, even when they're well into adulthood. You know, we always give them the excuse, oh, well, they were too young. They didn't know. Well, exactly when does adulthood actually kick in? I mean, we've got on, on our, our statute books that once you're 18, uh, you you can leave home and you are then responsible for your own actions. But in today's day and age, with the helicopter parenting moving into the, you know, when your children are in their 30s, and maybe even 40s, I mean, the notion of childhood and the notion of people being old enough to make wiser decisions, well, it's just been kicked out by a couple of decades, hasn't it? So, you know, we don't live in the 1914 or 1940 world anymore. And this is something that for older Australians or, you know, older people in the West, they have this sort of cognitive dissonance that they they can't understand why governments just don't crack down like they used to on people who have obviously done harm uh, to their countries. What used to be called treason is not called treason anymore. It's called foreign interference. You know, we, we use all these fluffy 21st century names and terms for stuff that really is what the old words yeah. really describe, right? Well, the old words did a, a better job of describing well, these things. It, it, look, it simplified things, Jeremy, and, yeah. and people would go out of their way not to do anything because the punishments were quite awful. I mean, firstly, there's the public humiliation of being caught out yeah. with your hand in the cookie jar. Then there was the likelihood that you would be put up against the wall and shot. And that itself would shame the family of the person in question. So there were lots of big consequences back in the olden days where you kind of thought to yourself very carefully, look, can I get away with it? And if there's a good chance of me being killed and my family being shamed for a generation, I probably would be, you know, nice yeah. nice to have the money, but bugger off, you know? Yeah, but going back to the ASIO thing, uh, mm. we should do a, a tit for tat kind of thing because if we have an Australian in a jail in China being accused of being a spy and being held, I think he has a death sentence, which they say will be uh, commuted after two years of good behaviour. But he, mm. nevertheless, he got a death sentence for being a spy, presumably yeah. for Australia or for the Western world or something. Now, we, mm. don't, we don't seem to be particularly condemning of that Chinese behaviour. Well, no, why, why don't we do exactly the same thing? And as I said, you, if, you, if you went, to, if you, you yeah. could probably arrest every single diplomat in the Chinese embassy in Canberra and probably pretty correctly describe him or her as a spy. Right. All right. Okay. Well, there is a double standard here, and we'll, we'll, you know, I mean, we can go through all the double standards that we've ever known, you know, with regard to, say, for instance, we ain't got that much time. I know, (laughs) but the the fact of the matter is, there is this double standard where, you know, we will allow an autocracy to get away with all sorts of, uh, you know, bad behaviour, criminal behaviour, treasonous behaviour, you know, but we will uh, we will walk away when confronted by other things. You know, we, we need to be firm and consistent in the application of our laws, and there needs to be a firm expectation that once you cross a certain line, there will be consequences. Now, mm. the fact of the matter in this case, Jeremy, there, there will not be the consequences that most people may be thinking would be normal and rational. This person will not be retrospectively brought before the courts and accused of anything in particular. Now, I mean, okay, you could say that there's an argument that uh, should the family of a person involved be dragged through the public uh, or the court of public opinion? Sorry for that, but I had to say it. No. Um, (laughs) Thank thank you for the plug. (laughs) No worries at all. (laughs) But, Uh. you know, I mean, I'm not so sure whether or not uh, that that's probably a good thing for them. And maybe the ASIO, you know, Mike Burgess in particular, may be very cautious about wanting to preemptively 
you know, let it all out in case there are these, you know, um, um, elements of uh, people outside of the immediate circle having been caught up in the drama by guilt by association. Yeah? Yeah, you're too young to remember, but I was telling people a little bit earlier uh, about uh, 1972, maybe early 1973, when uh, Gough Whitlam's new Labor government realised that ASIO did not trust them to look Mm. at files. They just didn't, as a government, the Attorney-General did not have access to ASIO files. And Whitlam and Lionel Murphy marched on ASIO headquarters down Macquarie Street with an entourage demanding, demanding that they hand over the ASIO files... Now, clearly there's been a bit of mistrust or distrust between our uh, Secret Service and uh, the the, the then Labor government. Maybe a hangover from that. I don't know. Look, it it may very well be, but I think that you'll always find that the intelligence services and the political parties in power will always have, one could say, creative tension between them because, you know, neither, neither, neither side of the House will be completely innocent. I mean, look, we uh, we at Sage International wrote uh, a report that was uh, funded by the Department of Defence um, back in 2021. 20, and, you know, one of the key conclusions that we came up with is that we're so enamoured by China's military threat to Australia, but China doesn't pose a direct military threat to Australia. It only poses a, a direct military threat to Australians and Australians in uniform if we were to join the Americans in a fight against the uh, the Chinese in Asia. Where the Chinese are a clear and present danger to Australia is in the foreign interference, in the cyber warfare, in espionage. These are the low cost, high impact kind of activities that the Chinese can obviously get away with in a free society. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and because we we play all you know all these weird uh, linguistic games about what is uh, a punishable act and what isn't and and we we get bent out of shape sort of describing what treason is and what it isn't um uh, you know uh, of course it makes us vulnerable because we don't have a firm commitment of what it takes for an Australian citizen, particularly at the leadership level, what it takes for them to be loyal. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, have a good weekend, John, and thank you for giving us your time. No problems at all, Jeremy. You too. Thank you very much. All the best. Dr John Bruni, Sage International. Rats in the ranks.